All right, I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for our fourth webinar in our series today. Today's topic is strategies to elevate your event. Uh, to discuss these strategies, trends, best practices for your events, we have Eric Bennett, USA Cycling's Director of Membership, and Kyle Knott, Director of National Events here at USA Cycling. Together, they have years of experience in the cycling industry, racing, events, everything. So during today's uh, webinar, feel free to ask any questions. You can write your questions in the Q&A box, and we will do our best to answer it during the webinar. If we can't get it uh, during the webinar, we will always answer them at the end of it. Uh, if you would like to verbally ask your question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, everyone during the webinar right now, though, is muted. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but other than that, let's uh, get to the webinar. Eric and Kyle, you can take it away. Sounds great. Thank you, Matt. Um, as Matt just said, I'm Eric Bennett. I'm the Director of Membership. I've been with the organization about two years, um, have a background with road, road cycling, um, now mountain biking, uh, corporate background in banking. So uh, very excited to be presenting with you all today. I'm sure that we've worked um, potentially in projects in the past, but very much I wanna showcase kind of how membership is integrated within the event ecosystem. So getting right into it, um, kind of an overview about everything that we'll be discussing today. Um, an overview, as I just stated, uh, explaining what the one-day license is, um, an annual membership. Obviously, that is kind of our, our primary product that we we sell here at USA Cycling. A uh, comparison of our annual versus our one-day licenses. Uh, Want to speak to a couple of new initiatives that we've been going forward with thus far in 2024, uh, an introductory rate, and then a bundled membership offering. And then lastly, I want to touch on clinics and, and what we've done on this front and how we can uh, support you all with executing clinics at your events. So here's a, a brief overview. Um, membership very much has been an inter integral part of the uh, grassroots landscape of competitive cycling. Uh, this is historically something that we've collaborated on as far as um, how do we give the, the rider the best experience? How do we provide enough events in their area to make their membership worthwhile? These are all things that we consider as, as far as our integration and cohesion with the events uh, landscape. Um, as I just said, like the USA Cycling License provides access to participation. This can be on the competitive front or the non-competitive fronts. And then benefits for riders and organizers alike. So this would be, um, specifically for the rider fronts, um, individual insurance at the event, and then the race organizer, we basically do all the checks and balances with the athlete's identity. So jumping into one day licenses. So high level overview, a one day license is just a temporary license enabling that member to participate in the events, whether it's competitive or non-competitive. One, one thing I really want to point out here is the notable benefits. A lot of organizers, riders alike, do not know that this is actually uh, embodied with insurance within the product. So each one-day license carries a $5,000 crash deductible. So if they do crash at your events, they are able to file a claim with their insurance provider um, and be compensated uh, or reimbursed for said crash. This is only applicable for that day of event, so just keep that in mind. But that is that is why the uh, fee is associated as it is, as that's covering basically the premium for that rider. Um, key points, as you know, this is just a low cost option to serve as a gateway for those riders new into the sport or those that want to try a new discipline. And uh, all of our one-day licenses here to all of our, our USA Cycling uh, protocol, ensuring rider compliance, uh, age, safe sport, um, and anti-doping standards. Jumping into our annual membership. So what is this? So this is our, our product that offers unlimited domestic racing. And I'm speaking specifically to our domestic race license, our, our standard product that is um, more or less the bread and butter of USA Cycling. It's what we've been constructed on from our ecosystem. Um, you will notice that I'm saying membership here instead of license. I think historically a lot of um, Older riders or maybe those that have raced in the past have always uh, heard of USA Cycling, uh, USA Cycling Racing License. 
And very much back then and, and to that nomenclature, we'd be associated with the DMV. It was kind of your, your ticket to ride. You were able to race because you hold this license. You know, fast forward to today and, and kind of the, the new age of USA Cycling, we're very much trying to correlate um, that from a license to a membership. So you're part of something bigger. Uh, a lot of individuals don't know that we don't receive any federal funding for our national team and our high caliber, high performance teams um, that are participating worldwide. A lot of their membership dues are contributing towards their success and their ability to race overseas and participate. So membership is very much an ecosystem. You're part of something larger, um, but in that you have that uh, eligibility to race domestically uh, in an unlimited capacity. Um, and this is going across all disciplines, not going to break those out for you, but you, you all know everything that we host um, from mountain bike to gravel. Within the USA Cycling membership, there are multiple insurance offer options um, from a $0 deductible policy to that three and $5,000 uh, policy. This has been something very well received from our, our user group, specifically that zero deductible policy. Um, what's unique about that is that covers the rider, not only at USA Cycling events, but anytime they're riding. So they could be commuting to work, they could be on a group ride, um, training, whatever, uh, anytime they're on their bike, uh, if they crash, their, their bills are covered. So that's all offered through our USA Cycling uh, Race Plus membership. Um, only our annual license holders are eligible to upgrade and acquire points through our ranking system. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, a steward of the sport. So this is going towards something greater and really the, the contributions of membership is really uh, elevating our high performance efforts. Here's just a quick graph for you all to see kind of the differences between our product offerings from our one day license to our race plus. Um, most notably, as I mentioned, the, the rider insurance um, on the race plus, uh, but then the ability to race unlimited amount within our both our race products compared to the specific one day license. Here's just a snapshot of kind of all the, the benefits in a, in a singular view in comparison side by side. Introductory membership. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, as something new that we've been trying in 2024. And I want to paint a landscape here with data. I uh, did not want to just throw numbers on the screen and have you all read and to try to digest them. But uh, follow me for a second. Um, so in 2023, we sold 17,000 one-day licenses, a remarkable number of participation. 60% of those have participated more than once. So equate that's about $30 for riding uh, at our events. Furthermore, 20% of that 70,000 have participated in four or more events. So very large number of athletes participating multiple times on a one day license. So that to be said, I reached out to those individuals that are participating multiple times, more or less paying for and some of an annual license and asking why, why are they participating in a one day license? In the vast majority, nine out of 10 would state that they just saw the one day license fee and bike edge and associated that with the checkout fee. Um, so basically just unaware that an annual license or annual option existed. So that is that is telling to me that we need to get more in front of them and, and showcase what is, an, what is the difference between the two. Obviously we're not gonna take away the one day option. It stands there for a reason, um, but we wanna just at least share the knowledge that an annual offering exists. So came to fruition was this introductory rate. Uh, we knew that is a, a tremendous gap from $15 to 110, but then seeing the data and understanding habits and trends with how many times an individual participates, we came up with a number of $49 as a first time, first year introductory offer. So this has been very well received on our front. Um, we, we target our one day license holders uh, post, post uh, events. Also, we get these ahead of this offer in front of uh, event organizers and clubs to showcase uh, a more tangible offering entering their first uh, year of USA Cycling. So 
this is something we can offer to all of you. Um, so certainly I, I will be in touch post this call, but wanted to share that this is something that we, we are very much willing and able to support you all with, with onboarding more members into the sport. All right, another new thing that we've been trying, and this is very recent, uh, we hosted a race in Bensonville. So we have a satellite office, which is more or less our mountain bike headquarters uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas. The, the office is in a bikeable building. So that being said, like you can literally ride your bike up the outside of the building all the way to the top. So last year during our grand opening, we hosted a race up the ledger. So it's a six story building and, and participants would be able to race their bike all the way to the top. A couple of weeks ago, we hosted another version of racing up the ledger. This time we wanted to try out a concept where we would bundle a membership into the entry. So this is a small event. It's a, it's a less than one kilometer time trial, more or less up the building. Uh, we wanted to keep the entry fee nominal um, since you're really only riding for two or three minutes, but we wanted to provide a great experience. So what we did is we offered these riders, anyone that had an annual license can just pay for the event, $20 registration fee. But those um, that have not been associated with USA Cycling historically or would need to purchase a one day due to a sanctioned event, we would just basically instilled an offer to where we would bundle their membership with the entry fee. Um, so that rate for this event, we, we just piloted $50. This actually had significant um, sign on. Uh, members, new members alike were, were just very enthusiastic about being able to essentially race for free while acquiring a USA Cycling membership. So um, again, something that we just piloted very fresh, brand new, but this is certainly something that we can work with you all on. Uh, as far as integrating into maybe your category five events um, or as you see fit. But uh, ultimately just want you to all to know that this can be an option um, for you to more or less worry less about one days and, and the checks and balances of those and then um, provide an offering like this to get them into the ecosystem, be able to race more frequently. Lastly, this is something that we have done um, was it 2022? So level up your ride clinics. So the concept of this, I'll just give a high level. Uh, we orchestrated a series of clinics that followed the American Criterion Cup in 2022. And we had a clinic structure for women, instructed by women that followed the race circuit. So the clinic would happen the day before the race or even the morning before the race. These women would learn from female instructors they would have a kind of reduced intimidation factor since we know our sport is predominantly male. But all to be said, what we learned from this is the structured curriculum and a rep uh, repeatable kind of model really worked at scale. We were able to replicate uh, state after state in 10 different stops, um, kind of the same experience for each of the riders. So our takeaway last year was how do we make this a more scalable measure uh, without reliant on traveling with a team. So we curated a level up your ride, more or less clinic in a box. So we have multiple disciplines ranging from road to mountain bike. Um, this is all free for you as an event organizer with USA Cycling. So what this provides is the curriculum to host the clinic, uh, your permit, a bike reg template, and then the marketing promotion. So we're going to make sure that you're receiving entries into your into your clinic ahead of your race or your events. Um, there's a link here, but it's bringing you to a landing page that's gonna explain more on applying to host a clinic or just adding the clinic to your existing permit. Um, and these are all two hours long, um, very much uh, uniform as far as the, the nomenclature and how the writers are being taught. Um, these were all professionally built uh, curriculums amongst all the disciplines. And again, we, we saw a tremendous level of success, success this last year when we just piloted with a few uh, standalone events. So again, nudging people into the sport, but more or less the try before you buy as far as um, running a clinic before you go straight into the race and just building your confidence and comfortability with, uh, with other riders and spectators. So that is it from the membership front. 
happy to answer any questions that anyone may have this time. All right, I guess I'll go. <laughs> Eric, do you want to uh, run the slideshow or you want to just stop sharing and then I can share mine, your preference? Um, I can run for you, yeah. Cool. No problem. All right, everybody, I am Kyle Knott. I saw a lot of familiar names here. So a lot of you I've worked with or you know are actually hosting events with you, such as Amara, Chip, just saw you not too long ago, uh, Micah, everybody in here. Um, I am definitely a more conversationalist than a really good PowerPoint guy like Eric. So uh, you will laugh at my slides, but I would love to kind of hear what your concerns are and things that you're going to be facing from an event perspective. Um, and then I think that can kind of be catering, you know, I'll do some general thoughts, but I'd love to hear where you're at and what you could, you know, have insights on and things like that. So Eric, you want to go ahead and switch for me? Just some staffing considerations, I think, as your event is growing. So I kind of came at it today from an event that, you know, maybe is a local regional level event or, you know, maybe a national event that you've been doing it forever and you are extremely, you know, tapped out as the race director and needing some help. So some staffing considerations. A volunteer coordinator is huge. It is you know, integral to every event. Um, it is a, you know, position that, you know, you really need help with because everybody knows you need, you know, crossing guards, you need all sorts of other things um, to help with an event. You can have a volunteer coordinator help with registration, um, all sorts of things. And so having this person on your staff, enabling them to go out, you know, reach out to the boys and girls clubs, the local high schools doing, you know, fundraisers, things like that, making sure that you can get, you know, the amount of people you need to elevate your event. Um, another thing is a safety manager, having somebody on your crew that is primarily concerned about the safety of the riders and making sure permits, everything like that are pulled, having all those things so that you as the race director can get pulled into a thousand different directions and rider safety is never going to be compromised. Um, so that is a person I definitely think, you know, adding if you don't already have it. And a lot of times as a race director, you are that person a lot. Um, and so it's nice if you can enable somebody else on your staff to handle that so that you can put out other fires. Um, marketing coordinator, you know, having somebody at small events, it's hard to have a marketing coordinator. Um, if you need help with this, there's tons of internships and things out there. Um, USA Cycling also has a benefit to any permitted at event that you can fill out a form with our marketing team and they will have paid social ads running, um, which if you are a cyclist and you've clicked on anything bicycle related on Facebook, Instagram, I am sure you are seeing a lot of ads for events, which is exactly what we want. Um, and then you've got your course manager. It's another role that kind of rolls into the race director. Um, but as your events get bigger and you're having to handle a lot of other things, it's really good to have that person that goes out, especially on a road race, gravel, mountain, make sure gates are shut. If you have course changes, making sure you have all sorts of things that, you know, the course is ready to go in gravel nationals. We had a whole crew that just was out on course, making sure that none of the arrows got flipped or blown over and things like that. Um, cause we had just some simple directional signage. At mountain bike events, we have people who ride ahead and make sure that, you know, things are ready to go. So those are just some staffing considerations, you know, to, to beefing up your staff, especially if you're running on a slim crew. All right, Eric. Ancillary events are also things that I think, you know, we, we at national events are trying to improve upon. I think that's a way that we can level up our national championships. Um, and I think it's, you know, there are race directors on this call that do a really amazing job with ancillary events. Um, you know, I think, you know, things that, you know, what does your community pride itself on? I know at Junior Nationals, we're going to have a Maramore crawl because that's what, you know, that they've done. Um, that's what, you know, one of the, you know, things that they do at their velodrome. So, you know, if there's a community activation event, if it's, uh, you know, if there's normally an arts fair, um, you know, one of our future venues has an Apple Festival um, that is going to be on the same day as one of our events so that we can tie into the community and really get people who, may not care about bike racing or even really had a way to find out about it, but they do have a way to be engaged with their local community. Um, and so they're going to come out just because they're going to do what they want to do, a craft fair or farmer's market, those types of things. Um, and so that goes into what organizations can you partner with? Are there, you know, expos as the, you know, outside of a handful of big events, expos aren't as popular as they once were because online consumers, things like that, you know, within the endemic, you know, cycling 
uh, groups. And so working with, you know, your local running store, your outdoor store, do you have, you know, uh, an ASPCA that wants to have an adoption event that's going to draw people out there that wouldn't come for just a bike race? Um, and so working on that is a really good way to kind of tie into your community. And then if you're currently working with a sports tourism or visitors bureau, um, those are always helpful. They have funding, they have a way to advertise, um, they can help you with grants. And that's what a lot of our local organizing committees are for our national championships. Um, and so I would highly suggest if you're not connected with one of those, that you do a little bit of research and make connections there. Um, there's also state funding ones that come in from states. Um, a lot of you, you know, the names I'm seeing on here, I'm sure are already working with these groups. Um, and so I would suggest if, if you need help, just go ahead and send me an email. So, all right. Other considerations. What are your previous participation numbers? Have you made changes in your schedule and seen an increase or decline um, in registration? Have you combined categories and seen increases or maybe potentially at the beginner level, um, you know, people aren't coming because they're intimidated or, you know, have you combined too many categories in road and, you know, the higher level athletes are saying, I'm not coming. It was a scary event because, you know, cat fours were in it kind of thing. Um, you know, but it, it can be said for everything because it's on the other side too, is did you get rid of categories and you're doing just, you know, general open participation fields and you're seeing a big boost. Um, so really pay attention to those numbers. Um, is it one of those things where you have metrics that are being tracked where, you know, you can learn from your event um, of going and looking and saying, you know, our paid social got this many people to the registration site, but only this percentage, you know, signed up. And if you're tracking year over year, kind of seeing what works, what doesn't work. Um, if you're doing paid social, it's looking at what ads are working. You know, who are you targeting? You know, those types of things to really just look at your previous numbers, see if your event is growing. And if there's certain things that, you know, you could do to change that. And maybe it is going to a pro one, two category for your race to get a bigger field so that it looks flashier, um, you know, for your sponsors that are coming out so that you're having that. Maybe it's going one, two, three, if you're a regional level. Um, and then, you know, on the next point, it's let beginners be beginners. Um, I think, Eric, you really hit on it. That beginner clinic is, is something that it makes people feel comfortable. Um, it allows an entry into a sport that we all know can be unforgiving if, if you have a bad experience. Um, so we want to make sure that, like, you're as welcoming as possible. And, you know, you have someone there that maybe if you see the Cat 5, maybe it's an email from Bike Reg saying, hey, if you're on site and you need some help kind of figuring out, you know, reach out to this person that can kind of walk them through it, you know, giving them the, Hey, this is your first time. Let's make sure it's a good one. Then you're going to get the people who are going to spread out and be like, man, that event was great. I had no clue what I was doing. You know, this is my first race and they helped me walk through it. And then next year, hopefully you get more beginners because you're beginner friendly. Um, and then lastly, just some other considerations, your signage and your safety, you know, it's making sure that those are, out there as needed, depending on the level of event, um, safety, having, you know, barriers, looking at barriers and not having the elevated feet, having flat feet. You know, if you have, um, you know, a Grand Fondo type event and you've got, you know, blow up things, you have to have all sorts of requirements of, you know, uh, a blow up uh, marker and things like that, making sure you have double generators, um, signage, making sure that you are looking at it from a beginner or a first timer. You know, it could be your elite professional racer coming to your event for the first time and they have no clue where registration is. They don't know where to go to find the schedule if they, you know, look for changes. So adding in signage of things that, you know, it's a cost incurred, but, um, you know, at Cyclocross last year, we did a big daily schedule right as you walk into the venue and we, we heard a lot of praise on that. So, you know, the more information you can get people, the easier it is because not everybody wants to be on their phone and looking it up. Um, but then you can also have a QR code for those who don't want to read it and they just want to put it on their phone and walk away. Um, you know, so those are kind of some things I put together, but I would love to hear any questions you have. Um, and then also, if you want to chat on offline, I'm happy to, um, you know, next slide, I believe is our email contacts. And like I said, I recognize a lot of the names and you're all putting on some really awesome events. Um, so even if you want to chime in with things that helped you grow from, you know, maybe local to regional to, you know, national level, um, I think it'd be beneficial for kind of just a, a group discussion. Yeah, feel free to uh, write your question in the Q&A box, or you can also, like I said, raise your hand and we can unmute you. One thing I was going to ask, Kyle, is uh, have you implemented any 
uh, new ideas into your event that you have seen like really enhance them. And on the other side, maybe wasn't a great idea. Maybe like some pros and cons of some of your um, ideas. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I know, um, you know, I look at registration numbers a lot. Uh, we move things trying to, you know, make it more cost effective, you know, condensing fields, things like that. Um, last year we moved our non-championship races in cycle cross and that was a huge fail, um, because it was everything at the beginning of the week. And so as people trickled in, it didn't do it. We did it because it was kind of a cost savings for us to try to, you know, manipulate, you know, that schedule and just kind of do things, uh, that didn't work. So I, I think that's a live and learn type of situation is like really pay attention to your numbers. Um, if you're moving things around, um, we listen to rider feedback and, you know, I think that's a big thing too, is getting out with those stakeholders of people who you know, are going to be supportive, but going to be pretty blunt, I always think is good. Um, you know, having those conversations for us, we, you know, went from where national events was, we're just going to do it, we're going to do it our way to, I mean, I can't tell you how many phone calls I've had with people who are just big supporters of cycling, but have historically been like, I, I'm not a big fan of national events because X, Y, and Z. And so we, we get a lot of buy-in from the community. So I think that's really good. Um, events for us, like having fun. We're trying to really, you know, have fun, like, you know, trying to put in quirky ideas of like whole shot preems or, you know, things like that into our national championships. Um, you know, also making sure collegiate, they're having like collegiate dinners and things again, that used to be really big, but the trend in cycling has gone, you know, it used to be so just elite race, 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 race to because of the gravel boom, everybody wants kind of that experiential type thing. They, there are people who still want to race and want to race. We saw that at gravel nationals and we catered towards, you know, we are racing, but you still want to have a fun experience. And so I, I would really encourage everybody to do things that are just going to be fun at your event that may not have anything to do with just the, the pure racing aspect, because you'll find that a lot more people, you know, will hopefully come out to your event. We're trying to do that with nationals as we grow is like, you know, there are a lot of people who are qualified for nationals that don't race nationals because they think it's just cutthroat racing. I'm only there to win a Jersey. And yeah, there are people who are going to be there for that, but I want people to come to nationals as like a reunion with their friends. I'm revamping the, the national uh, um, schedule for master's track because a lot of the input was a couple of years ago, you know, the schedule got changed to where it was all racing on one day for sprints, all, you know, things like that. And, you know, those riders reached out to me when I came back and said, I just want to be here to hang out with my friends. Can we please mix the schedule back in? So I see, you know, people who aren't just sprinters. And so, yeah, listen to your constituents. I would, I would highly suggest that. So we do have a question from Tim here on the spectrum of office park crit to Tulsa tough. What are some of the most important variables to attract racers from a broader region if we want to be a venue more oriented towards uh, toward uh, a Tulsa Tough? I have heard conflicting feedback that pays out matter. I can tell you right now, payout, everyone says they want it, but it's like the top three people that get it. I mean, we've had big payouts before at events and the field uh, doesn't come. I've also, you know, in the Southeast is where I did a ton of my racing I talked to some women's racers because all the big payout races were some of the smallest fields. And I heard from a, uh, the women's racing perspective is the higher the payout, they thought there would be more of these elite riders and they'd have no chance at it. And so they didn't want to get in the mix. Um, so payout, it's one of those things. I mean, you could throw a massive prize purse and get the same field that you had, or you can elevate the prize purse because there are racers who are going to race to make a living. And you do want to attract some of those big teams but it's better to put it into safe racing. So racers right now are really orientated on safe racing. That's fencing going around. Um, that's going to be, you know, signage. If you're going to signage using um, the mess mesh signage that we do at nationals um, and, you know, that helps with wind kicks in. So elevating your safety, I think is going from, you know, office park crit to Tulsa tough. Uh, but the biggest thing when you look at Tulsa, it's just a really fun event. The community is bought in. Um, when I raced Tulsa Tough, they didn't really have any of the uh, referees with whistles and it was just pure chaos on the street. Now they have community buy-in that, you know, people are, are getting out there and helping keep the racers safe, but also make sure that Crybaby Hill is still awesome. So that goes back into your con the considerations I had of like, what is your community known for? How can you get your community out there? So you know, moving away from the office park and getting into, you know, your visitors bureaus to host it downtown and activate around restaurants, going to those restaurants and saying, hey, 
turn four could be sponsored by your restaurant. You move your bar out to the street and you, know, you have all these things. It's really kind of getting creative. Uh, but I wouldn't say prize payout is going to be the, the top thing, uh, Tim. I I'd highly suggest focus on the community because racers want to be at events that are awesome. Athens, when it was big time and, you know, all that stuff was just the craziest race because there were people there to watch. So the more people you get there, the more racers want to be there. Awesome. And then one thing I do want to um, add is the paid social campaign that uh, Kyle brought up a little bit earlier. Um, I did put it, I did answer a couple of the questions with a link to the paid social campaign. So if you guys are able to see that, do so. If you cannot, you can email me at m w a i t e at usacycling.org and I will send you the link. After this as well, I will send um, the link out to the group so all of you can um, see that. And then uh, you'll get some geo-targeted 30-day marketing, um, which we've actually seen some great results on. So some events have actually been seeing about a 10 to a 20% increase year over year numbers. So uh, it looks like we do have someone that wants to verbally ask a question, Jim Soda. So I'm going to allow him to talk. All right, Jim. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Oh, great. Uh, I just want to say uh, appreciate you doing this, first off. Uh, I've been doing my event for about 11 years now. Uh, and one thing I've drastically noticed, which I'm sure most other um, race organizers have, is you know, we're getting a lot of gravel riders out there now. Uh, fewer road racing going on. So I'm, I'm trying to just... Uh, trying to keep tra track with those um, gravel riders and trying to get them to come back and each, you know, do it again, try it. Uh, any suggestions for that? Uh, I do have a large gravel event that goes on a part of the same course done by a local guy that's very successful. Um, but I do see some you know, crossover riders, obviously, doing both the road and the gravel. Uh, well, I'm just trying to keep tabs on them and you know, keep them interested. Uh, my course is pretty hilly, which I think helps. So uh, I don't know if there's any other suggestions for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say gravel, it's it's a lot about the experience. I would, you know, with that group, it's it's finding out, you know, reaching out to the, the riders, you know, if you have your registration data saying like, hey, what can we do to improve this event? What would bring you back? You know, what would get you to, you know, have more of your friends come out? Like, are there things? you know, that we can improve upon because like that experience is really what drove gravel. Um, so I would say pay attention to that. I'll let Eric, I mean, Eric knows the trends way more than I do in terms of like race days and things like that. So he may have a bit of a different perspective. Jim, a great, great question. Um, so what we're seeing from the gravel to road crossover is, is very much, we are seeing a lot of gravel athletes jump back into road. I think they are missing that kind of that Peloton feel. I know a lot of gravel events, um, the not pointy end, you're kind of on your, you're on your own and doing a more or less a time trial and, and a race against yourself. Um, so yeah. what I would, I would suggest or recommend is maybe, you know, if you're doing some clinics leading up to your races, reinvigorate, re-engage those gravel riders to instill confidence with them cornering fast or cornering in a group. Um, you know, you're going to showcase some within this curriculum, you're going to showcase some different tactics or just sprinting, um, mindset or gearing considerations. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, I think as cyclists, everyone's looking to always get better or get faster or improve or work on something. I think this is a new way to, to engage with them and just, yeah, like you're, you're a great gravel rider. Um, let's try something different and you're kind of going to be challenging them more or less by, going through these clinics and they're going to be, you know, right in it again and, and engaged with trying to compete at their highest level or their, their, whatever their, that may be on their fronts, but instilling confidence that they can race with a pack again and having some sort of uh, dynamics within, within the Peloton. Yeah. I, I have found that uh, some of the, the, uh, the road riders are still coming They're in, in, enticing their friends to come out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mainly, I think because you know we try to have some really good volunteers. Uh, I work as a tourism association and uh, get some great help with them. And the, the, most of the volunteers I get are really good 
Uh, they're very encouraging at the intersections and they really engage with the riders. And, and I got a good timer at this point. So all that's been helping. Uh, so I hope it continues to. <laughs> so. yeah, that's the thing, though. It goes back to Kyle's point of the experience. I think that was what, um, in my opinion, made Gravel Nationals so successful this last year for USA Cycling was the riders felt safe, but then they also experienced the encouragement from spectators and officials and course marshals alike. So it was a competitive atmosphere, but they were encouraged the whole way. And, and same to be said with what you're doing on the gravel and road friends. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. And then Matt, I see Newt's question um, from Snake Alley, dropping a uh, significant drop in women coming to the races. Um, and wondering if the trend is elsewhere. So if anybody else is noticing that too, I can say from a national championships perspective, absolutely. Our women's fields are way down, um, you know, and, and it's hard because it's, you know, we at nationals, you know, have separate age groups for every women's field. And, you know, this year we're actually going to be doing a lot of combination of fields on the men and the women's side, because our younger men masters, um, you know, it's the same thing. We are, we're not getting a lot. So we're having to combine the field to get bigger fields and more enjoyable racing. I think some of it is due to, like Eric said, like people miss pack racing. And when you come to an event and there's smaller fields, it's not as fun. You have to be super fit. <laughs> and then if you come into a race with bigger fields, you can enjoy it. So it's kind of this weird chicken or the egg right now in women's cycling. Um, I think the clinics that Eric, you know, is talking about, you know, I would suggest trying one of those and getting women out there. And then it's, you know, it goes back to that, let beginners be beginners. I think for women, that beginner category always gets shoved in and smashed in with the other category because there may only be 10 or 15 participants. Um, you know, so it might be worth trying, you know, two years, we are going to have a beginner women's field. We are going to advocate for this. We're hosting clinics. We're going to get, you know, some of the, the pro riders are coming to, especially to snake alley, um, you know, to kind of do this, like welcome to racing and be friendly and social. Um, because I think after COVID most people there, if it's not a friendly atmosphere and they're not feeling welcome for that first event that they do, or, you know, any event they're, they're not coming back. They'll just go ride and do their own thing. And, and they're not worried about it. So I would highly encourage doing clinics that make a beginner feel welcome because that's what's happened with the women's field is, it's not as welcoming. So you're not getting this, you know, bottom up mentality. I'm absolutely going to piggyback off what Kyle said. I think, uh, again, to reiterate, like the clinic piece, but then also since such a recognizable event, a lot of, of high caliber professional athletes on the men's and women's side show up, leverage them. You know, they're, you know, they're going to register, uh, maybe reach out beforehand to see if you can schedule them for an hour or two um, to maybe pre-ride the course with some individuals, do small group rides uh, against instill confidence. That's really all it is. Um, you're going to, what we saw with the women's level up your ride clinics was most, most participants brought a friend and they did it together. And then they were inevitably going to go try the race them, you know, as a group. Um, it's scary when you're doing something by yourself and you really have no idea what you're doing. So I think the more, engaged you can be with your your community um the more success you're going to have and I, I agree with kyle as well with a two-year hold yourself accountable to it um this first year yes let's try some marketing let's try some a clinic maybe the turnout's not great but then that's going to snowball the next year because those participants had a great experience and they're going to tell their friends and then it's going to just keep trickling from there so um, we're seeing it at scale. Kyle's, Kyle's on it. Um, but those races that I engage with, particularly on the clinic fronts and, and the membership engagement, if they commit to it, um, whether their club is hosting a, a clinic specifically for women or the event is hosting a women's specific clinic, they're, they're seeing success. We've had some clubs in, in New York specifically that have had over 100% growth in their women's fields. And this is going from 10 to 20 to 30. So it's not um, something that's unattainable by any means. Gary, would you like to um, get unmuted and talk about uh, the Green Mountain Stage Race? I have to find you. I have allowed you to talk if you would like, Gary. <laughs> Well, what Gary said at the Green Mountain Stage Race, we had great success with women last year with 76 women 
in the Pearl 123 field and 46 for the 34 novice field. We do offer equal prize money and work really hard to attract women and work with women's teams to help get in, um, get them into the event. That's great, Gary. I, I think that's a, a big growth um, opportunity there. I see, I see you're off mute now. If you want to share a bit more about that experience and, and maybe help with Newt quest, Newt's question. Maybe not. <laughs> Is this any better? Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go, Gary. Yep, you you're can good now. <laughs> okay, good. I had to open my laptop, sorry. Um, didn't know that it was off mute. So uh, the women's fields, as uh, we mentioned, have been a constant and consistent challenge in the two races I organized, the Green Mountain Stage Race and the Killington Stage Race. And it's just been so gratifying when we've had really, really large women field, women's fields. And I might... What I've discovered is that it sort of builds on itself. If I, I really work hard to try to get the women racers to register early, because I find when we get some teams registered early, more teams want to race and then they register. Um, and I, I, you know, having 70, the Green Mountain Stage Race, that was the 23rd um, race last year. And it was the largest uh, pro one, two, three wins field that we've ever had with 76 women. Um, and I think the women, you know, I really tried to push that in the marketing that I sent out um, to people, just saying what a better experience the group of women that we had would would uh, get at the race, because how often do they get to race in a field with 76 other women? It's pretty rare. I mean, I know at Redlands, they had even more this this last week. Um but it, it's it's very rare. So I think a lot of them wanted to take the opportunity to see what it was really like to race in a, you know, a big field. It's so different racing. I mean, men's racing, just take it for granted that the field will be, you know, 70, 80, 100, 120 riders. But for women, you know, they're often racing with 10 other women or five or 15. It's just not the same as um, as being in a, a giant group. So really starting early and trying to work with the women's teams, trying to get them to register early, offering some incentive for them to do it, just kind of builds its own momentum, I think, in the end, and, and then more women race. And I, I hope this wasn't a one-year thing. I did hear from some women that they thought there were too many women in their field. Um, I think they just weren't, weren't used to racing with so many other racers on the road all at the same time. But that was a, I think only one or two people mentioned that as a you know, as a concern. Um, but hopefully this year we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get a similar turnout anyway. That's amazing, Gary. Absolutely. And uh, the early and often, yes, I think this communication works not only on the women's front, but men's as well, but encouraging any of those teams that you know they're going to be coming to the race to um, register early. I think uh, one of the things that's been successful in the past is leveraging a local hotel and blocking off a book of rooms and reserving those just for the teams that are attending your race. They, they feel, you know, even if they're getting a small discount, they're going to feel very special. The fact that you're doing that on their behalf and a very welcoming environment. So that can be done for the women's and the men's side, but ultimately, yes, um, communicating early and often and, and just showing that uh, it's a trickle effect of once people are registering, then even more are going to want to come. So it's, it's quite the contrary of the last minute registration that we're seeing amongst all races now.